Hi everybody and welcome to Hope Church Alongside talking about the book of Isaiah and today we're looking at Isaiah chapter 20. Uh, now this talk was originally going to be about Isaiah 19 which was about Egypt and Assyria and the way that God was going to heal the nations and we are going to come back to that. But as I planned the talk series I was really drawn to this, this text in Isaiah 20 because of the idea of, of the weirdness of it sort of holy weirdness. Now, I mean, you might be thinking, doesn't the Church of Jesus have enough weirdos in it? I mean, do we do we really need to be encouraging weird behavior in the Church of God? And we are going to, what we're going to be talking about is what kind of weirdness we want, because I think the answer to that is yes. I mean, I think we do, we do need more weirdness, but not any kind of weirdness. I think you need some kind of special kinds of weirdness. And this is a kind of weirdness that underpins Isaiah's role as a man of vision, as a man who sees beyond the surface, who looks up, who looks down, and he and he talks about the salvation Lord. And I, I think I think we're going to see that we actually need a bit of weirdness if we're going to be heard and we're going to be taken seriously on this. So let's pray. And then we're going to read the text. Lord, you, you sent Isaiah and you sent Jesus and you sent us. And these men did things that we would never, ever do. And as we read this, I pray that you would put your finger on some of the other things that we might never want to do, but we might have to. Amen. Isaiah chapter 20. Uh, NIRV. Sargon, the king of Assyria, sent his highest commander to the city of Ashdod. That's a Philistine city. He attacked it and captured it. Three years earlier, the Lord had spoken to Isaiah, the son of Amos. The Lord had said, take off the rough clothing you're wearing and take off your sandals. So Isaiah did. He went around barefoot and naked. After Ashdod was captured, the Lord said, My servant Isaiah has gone around barefoot and naked for three years. He is a sign and reminder to Egypt and Cush about what will happen to them. The king of Assyria will lead prisoners away from Egypt and Cush. Young people and old people alike will be taken away. Like Isaiah, they will be barefoot and naked. Their backsides will be bare, so the Egyptians will be put to shame. People trusted in Cush to help them. They bragged about what Egypt could do for them, but they will lose heart and be put to shame. At that time, the people who lived on the coast of Philistia will speak up. They will say, see what has happened to those we depended on. We ran to them for help. We wanted them to save us from the king of Assyria. Now, how can we escape? Right, so where are we in Iron Age history? I know that's a question you guys always love to ask when uh, when these kind of things come up. You're really excited to know that. So the answer is we're, we're about 715, 714 BC. And Isaiah is really, theoretically, he, he should be in a pretty good place because the the kings that he's been opposed to for a while have have died and this great new king has come to the throne hezekiah and hezekiah and isaiah are definitely on the same page isaiah is going to be hezekiah's royal prophet he's the guy that hezekiah goes to when he's got a problem and yet isaiah is in sackcloth he's in mourning just when you would have thought everything was going right for him and suddenly things were fixed still he's in mourning and that's because he sees the surface we can be very distracted by superficial things by political events or we can be distracted by coverage that maybe christianity gets in the media or some celebrity who endorses this that or the other or you know prayers in in u.s presidents in or whatever it is but actually, deep down below the surface, there are spiritual processes that might be much darker or much better, but in this case, much darker than it looked on the surface. So Isaiah is already in mourning, but Isaiah's life is about to become a notch more difficult. So Isaiah is told to 
take off the rough clothing you're wearing, take off your sandals, and he goes around barefoot and naked. And that is incredibly humiliating. Now, I don't know actually how naked he was. He might have been like walking around in his underwear. But I mean, don't try this at home, boys and girls. You'll get arrested. I mean, this is an incredibly humiliating thing. This is what people did to prisoners of war. It's a, it's a bit like maybe now Isaiah pretending to be homeless, you know, wearing dirty clothes, worn out shoes from Shoe Zone or, or something like that. People might even be laughing at him. They're mocking him. Uh, there was one guy in a in a church I used to go to who uh, decided to play out David stripping down to his underwear to dance before the Lord, and it like it definitely created an impression, definitely created impression, definitely stuck in the memory. Not not sure it necessarily achieved much more than that, but this was something that was that was humiliating, and Isaiah is going round shaming himself. Now, the big question is, why? Now, in one sense, we've got a fairly obvious answer to that. So he says, and you can see that in verse 5, he says, people trusted in Cush to help them. They bragged about what Egypt could do for them, but they will lose heart and be put to shame. At that time, the people who live on the coast of Philistia will speak up. They will say, see what has happened to those we depended on. We ran to them for help. We wanted them to save us from the king of Assyria. Now, how can we escape? Um, and that's the kind of almost the standard thing that you would expect to see as Isaiah prophesies about the nations. That God says to Israel, don't depend on the nations. Don't depend on military strength. Don't depend on human power. Depend on me. And this is a message that's been given to Philistia, which is the small country just on the, on the west coast there of, modern, um, of Israel. Now... There is, however, another element to this. So in verse 3, it says, My servant Isaiah has gone around barefoot and naked for three years. He is a sign and reminder to Egypt and Cush. In other words, he's not just a sign to Judah, and he's not just a sign to Philistia. He's also a sign to Egypt and to Cush. Now, that in itself is odd. Because the prophet Isaiah is prophesying to people who don't worship him. Go back one chapter to verse 19 and you can begin to see why that might be. So in chapter 19, it says this. At that time, the people of five cities in Egypt will worship the Lord. He is the Lord who rules over all. They will use the Hebrew language and they worship him. They will promise to be faithful to him. One of those cities will be called the city of the sun. At that time, there will be an altar to the Lord in the middle of Egypt. There will be a monument to him at his border. They will remind people that the Lord who rules over all is worshipped in Egypt. The people there will cry out to the Lord. And it says in verse 22, the Lord will strike Egypt with a, with a plague, but then he will heal them. They will turn to the Lord and he will answer their prayers and heal them. In other words, God is going to bring the Egyptians to himself. And what Isaiah is doing is not just speaking about Egypt. He's speaking to Egypt and he's also becoming like Egypt. Isaiah is humiliating himself as he becomes like the Egyptians who were going to be humiliated. He is, if you like, carrying their shame. So he could have, there were other ways he could have pointed the finger at Egypt. You know, he could have stamped on a cucumber or, you know, sort of worn a crocodile skin jacket from the Nile or something like this. But he doesn't. He takes the shame of Egypt on himself. Now, when we see this, we can begin to understand what the big picture is here. Is that Isaiah is a picture of Jesus. So Jesus was not one of us. He was in very nature God. But he didn't count equality with God something to be grasped, but emptied himself and took the form of a servant. 
So just as Isaiah has taken the form of an Egyptian captive, he stepped down from his position as royal prophet to appear like a humiliated Egyptian. So Jesus stepped down from heaven and stepped into our world of humiliation, of pain and shame. In other words, Jesus became like us so that we could be like him. He carried our shame so that we could be healed in the same way that Isaiah is kind of carrying the shame of Egypt, not just so that he can point the finger at them, but also so that they can see a way to be healed. Isaiah is a picture of Jesus. In other words, we're now beginning to understand what it means to be good weird. See, the world is after being respected, being admired. Um, studies have shown that as people have grown richer, they don't get any happier. And that's mostly because they spend their time comparing themselves with each other. We're really concerned about what people think of us. That's one of our number one priorities. And people use religion as a way of kind of making themselves appear or feel good compared to other people. And although as Christians we see Jesus taking our shame, it's really easy for us to slip into this same thing. You know, worrying about, you know, how do we look? How much money do we have? What kind of job do we have? What kind of education do we have? And sometimes it's really hard for us to identify with people whose values and whose lifestyle we, we don't really get. We might find people's conversation not that interesting or or we might find that they dress in a way that's different to us or their relationships seem pretty, maybe even shambolic compared to our relationships. And we find it very easy to be to look down on people or to put distance between us and them. We I remember going to uh, maybe I've told you this, going to a church in West London when I was doing I just graduated. So I, you know, I. I graduated with a good degree and I, I you know, always thought of myself as pretty high performing. People just wouldn't talk to me because of the way that I looked. You know, I looked like I was I didn't have a lot of money and I wasn't doing a high powered job. And people just wouldn't talk to me. And I ended up in order getting people to talk to me, I had to sort of make my language much more complicated. Well, we can do that. We can send out codes and ways of saying, actually, we we don't want to live with shame. We we want to be people who are respected, people who are admired. We want to be part of the in crowd. And as we do that, we kind of become unlike Jesus. We sort of do the opposite of what Isaiah did. And as we do that, it becomes very difficult for us to pray for people becomes very difficult for us to love people. We can't understand or empathize with people's worlds anymore because we've actually put a whole load of emotional energy into not being like those people. And we can become people who inflict shame rather than people who accept shame to, to pray for others and to live with others and to serve others with the good news of Jesus and and in other ways. So let's go back to that question, do we need more weirdness in the Church of God? Now, it, it might be that you might think, hey, look, I'm not going to be like Isaiah. There's heck no way I'm going to do that kind of stuff and the whole kind of weird clothes and, and sort of spectacular public things, you know, I but that's, that's not going to be me. I, you know, and probably it isn't. I'm not saying there's no place for that. Um, I just, uh, just as a sort of random example, a, a friend and I once uh, did a thing down on the Curry Mile around Easter where we decided to do a, a prophetic shoe shine. We would just give people free shoe shines because we said Jesus washed people's feet. Actually, it was a lot of fun. So I'm not saying you never do things like that, but that's actually not the main kind of weirdness that I think the Lord's pointing us to. I think the main kind of weirdness is to give up our interests, to accept shame, to accept pain. Sometimes we even have to do it within our community when people hurt us. 
And as we go out to the world to identify, to empathize with the world, not to, not to look down on people who are different from us, not to, not to judge or criticize or, 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 to, or to sort of walk on people's heads, to accept poverty and to accept our, our integration into the lives of just ordinary hurt and broken people around us. So both within our communities, the church and actually outside in the world, to stand with people to empathize with people, not to look down on them, to, but to become like people. Now, that's weird, but it's good weird. It's, it's Jesus weird, and I think we need more of that. So here we go. Um, last thing, uh, let's have a look at some questions. It would be great to talk about some of these on Sunday, and I guess the first one will be, do we, do we see that in ourselves? I think these are things to pray about maybe as well, is to talk about. Do we see ourselves distancing ourselves emotionally from people? Saying, hey, well, if you've got problems, that, that is your fault. That's your bad. I'm glad I'm not like you. Do we, do we find ourselves doing that instinctively? And I guess a, a second question is, are we afraid of shame? Are we maybe looking over at other people, whether those are those are as part of our church community or outside it, actually being afraid of that shame and backing away from things that could take us deeper into love for others because you know, there might be shameful things there. And the third one, I j just think of someone who's like Isaiah, this kind of good weird, this way of identifying with Jesus and identifying with people that Isaiah modeled here. Do you know someone who's been an example to you of that? So really looking forward to talking about this with you on Sunday. Uh, please pray about it and I'll catch you soon.